One of the things that I love about church, and our church in particular, is we preach the Bible. I'll say that again. We preach the Bible. And, you know, it's interesting to me how so many places and so many uh, pastors just begin to veer away from Scripture. Now, I don't want us to ever do that. And, you know, you guys as elders have permission. If I ever do veer away from Scripture, you have full permission to do whatever it is that you need to do. Probably a swift kick in the rear end, I would imagine. We are in this series of Acts, and we've been spending a lot of time, and I've had, had a lot of great feedback from a lot of you just as we've gone through each chapter, just talking through just all of the, the victories and all of the struggles and all of the miracles and all of the things that, that comprise the early church in the book of Acts. And it's just been amazing just to see how God has moved and how he's grown the church and how people have surfaced and how other people have had to, uh, uh, have not surfaced, you know, uh, people that have, have done things that are contrary to the word of God and, and gone against the Lord. There, were, there was consequences to that. It's all of the things that are comprised of what church is all about. There, there is no difference really in the early church issues and the same issues that we have even today. There are so many things that they dealt with and they're like, man, that was pretty crazy. And I'm like, yeah, that just happened last week here. We see this over and over again because the church is comprised of people. And as the church being comprised of people, with people comes people stuff. And there are things that happen uh, with people because people have feelings and people have emotions and people have uh, different uh, sets of, of ideals. They have all kinds of different things. And so, but this is also what the beauty of the church is all about, is that there is a collective of people that come from all different walks, they come from all different places, and they come together unified by one thing. And that is Jesus Christ. And this is the beauty of what the church is, that it's comprised of people and people worshiping one singular person, and his name is Jesus. And we have the help of the Holy Spirit through this whole thing. The Holy Spirit is who unifies us. The Holy Spirit is who gives us gifts. The Holy Spirit is the one that brings us uh, you know, all kinds of discernment and all kinds of great, wonderful things. And, and this is the great thing about the church, that a unified church is where we see a move of the Holy Spirit. Every time you see throughout history, when the church began to move in powerful ways, it was a move of the Holy Spirit. People acknowledged the Holy Spirit's presence, and then they also welcomed the Holy Spirit. And this is something that we do on a regular basis. We welcome the Holy Spirit here. I want the Holy Spirit to move freely in this place. But sometimes based on our background and based on maybe our upbringing or maybe the denomination that we came from or different places, uh, we get a little uncomfortable when we talk about the Holy Spirit, when we talk about the gifts of the Spirit. There, you know, we're, it's okay to speak about some, but others I'm just a little bit too uncomfortable with. And every time we do that, and every time we vocalize our uncomfortableness, I believe that the Lord does something. He begins to, to stir something within us, and if we're open to it. He takes the heart of stone that we had, that was opposed to the things of the Spirit, and he begins to soften and kind of massage our heart. And soften towards the things of the Spirit. And the more inviting that we are to the things of the Spirit, the more, I believe, that the more He wants to move among His people. And so we see this over and over again throughout the book of Acts. There's a move of the Spirit. And then there are people that kind of get uncomfortable or they try to, uh, to incorporate their rules or their, their religious acts into things. And then there's a correction. 
And then the, there's another move of the Spirit. And then people get a little bit uncomfortable yet again. Oh, it, it, there has to be more to it than just that. We read in, in the last chapter how there, there were a, a segment of people, that, there were some Jewish believers that were trying to incorporate this thing called circumcision into the Gentiles and saying, in order for you to be a follower of Christ, in order for you to be a, a Christian, you got to be circumcised too. And I'm going to just, I'm, let me just say this real quick, Karen, I'm, I'm sorry, because the, the word and term circumcision is not fun if you're doing sign language. So, and we're going to use that term a few times today. So I'm apologizing ahead of time. So we're moving to chapter 16 now. And I love that we we talked about how conflict happens and how do we we resolve conflict in the last chapter, either theological or personal differences, how we resolve those things. But now we're starting to see a little bit of the same thing, but from a different way. And so if you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 16 and verse 1. This chapter, we are introduced to a new person in the narrative of the book of Acts, and his name is Timothy. Paul begins his second missionary journey with this man named Timothy. So we have Paul, and then you heard just briefly about a man named Silas in the last chapter, and Timothy. And then later in this chapter, you'll you'll actually see, and I'm going to show you, that Luke is actually with them too, even though he doesn't name himself, but I'll show you how we know this. Timothy, though, he is Paul's protege. He mentions Timothy 26 times in six different letters of the New Testament. He's referred to as my beloved faithful son in the Lord in 1 Corinthians 4, 17. In Philippians, he commends Timothy saying, I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for you like him. Paul is, he also later encourages Timothy in two letters of the New Testament. And he's dealing with some people within the church. And he uses even his own qualifications then to qualify the elders and deacons that he's dealing with. And so he's this young man, he's full of knowledge, uh, and, and he knows the scripture, and he, became, he becomes this devout disciple of not only Jesus Christ, but he becomes a devout disciple of Paul. And I'll just say this, everyone needs a, a Paul in their life. Everyone needs a Barnabas in their life. Barnabas, uh, his name was actually encouragement. Everybody needs an encourager in their life. But they also need a Timothy in their life too. Someone that they are then discipling as well. And so it depends on, sometimes I, I kind of uh, I, I make the illustration of kind of like a sandwich, you know. You need someone that is ahead of you. And you're the, you're the peanut butter and jelly in the middle. And then you need somebody that's coming behind you too. That you're, deci- you're being discipled and you're discipling someone. You're, you're encouraging someone. You are mentoring or leading someone. And we see this model with Paul. And so this is where we begin our reading in Acts 16, starting in verse 1. It says, Paul also came to Derbe and Lystra, As a disciple there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. And here's just a little fun fact about his mom, Timothy's mom. We learn what Timothy's mom's name is in 2 Timothy 1 verse 5. And his, uh, actually his mom and his grandma, his mom was Eunice and his grandmother was Lois. Verse 2 says, he was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. And Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him. And he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places. For they all knew that this father was a Greek. Now wait a minute. 
In the previous chapter, I thought we had settled the matter of circumcision. That Paul had said, hey, we don't need you to be set to be circumcised in order for you to be a follower of Christ. So now we see that Paul is, he's circumcising Timothy. Like, I, I don't understand what is happening here. Well, let me just show you what is, what is going on. So in order for, for Timothy to have some kind of credibility with the Jewish people that he is actually ministering to, see, they all knew that his dad was Greek, so they knew that he wasn't circumcised. And let me just tell you that anything that would, would keep a Jewish person from wanting to know more would be someone or something that, that was contrary to the law. And so Paul did this intentionally with Timothy in, in order for Timothy to have clout with the Jewish people. Are you following me? This is, I'm, I'm putting my teacher cap on here just for a moment. And so the, the issue of circumcision was for the Jewish men, not the Gentile men. It was the Jewish believers who were trying to make the Gentiles do as the Jewish people did, not as believers should. And so Paul, he was against those who made circumcision necessary for salvation, but he, he, he did something to in order for for Timothy to be able to relate to the Jewish people in a better way. So what he did then is this very thing. He did it out of consideration for the Jewish people. He considered where they were spiritually. He considered where they were uh, in terms of, let me just tell you, thousands of years of the law is deeply ingrained into the Jewish people. And it's when you have that much ingraining, it's really difficult to get past some of these things. I think about even our own traditions and our own things, even that we do here as a church, and how sometimes we get in the mode of like, well, we've always done it this way, so this must be the way. And this is no different. We've always circumcised, so this must be the way. And so he does this out of consideration to the people that he was ministering to. Verse 4 says, And as they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance of the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and the elders who were in Jerusalem. This is the issue of circumcision that they were delivering this message, even though he just circumcised Timothy. It's just interesting to me. So the churches, they were strengthened in their faith and they increased in their numbers daily. Man, this is, this is the beauty, is that when a church is encouraged, the church grows. When a church is, when, when there's just even a little flame within the church and you begin to fan the flame, the, the church begins to grow. When, when you start to invite the Spirit of God into a place and, and He is welcome into a, a place of worship, things begin to happen and the church begins to grow. And so uh, what, what he is doing here, what Paul is helping Timothy do is uh, this thing called being all things to all men that he might win some. And this in 1 Corinthians 9, 22 says this, I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. And I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I might share with them in its blessing. And so in doing what Paul did to Timothy, he was removing any obstacle that would deter people from hearing the gospel. And so this really got me to thinking about just how we do church and how we walk out our faith personally. It begs the question, what kind of stumbling block are we to the people that we're trying to reach? What am I doing that is preventing someone from hearing the gospel? What aspect of my life 
is a reflection of my spiritual life that someone else sees and they don't like it. And they say, you know what, I, I really don't, I don't want that. Or how have I made it difficult for people to come to Jesus? See, this is a question I think we all need to wrestle with. This is the question that as a church we have to wrestle with. What are the things that we do? What are the traditions that we have? What are the, what are the things that we hold tightly to that are preventing us from reaching people that we're actually wanting to see? Is there something that we do that would turn off unbelievers aside from the obvious of calling out sin? Is there something that is ruining our witness? Is there a behavior that makes people run the other way? They're like, they see you coming. You're like, oh, here it comes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and like, oh, hey, what's going on over here? <laughs> see, I, I think there are people in everyone's life that we tried to share the good news, the gospel with. But there are elements of our own life that as we share the good news with them, they see us in a different lens. And they're like, you know what, if, if, if that is what it means to be a believer, then I don't know that I want that. And this is the difficulty sometimes, is that we want so badly for this person to be saved. We want so badly for this person to be free. We want so badly for this person to, to get out of the life and the lifestyle that they are in. And yet, at the same time, we're doing things that are actually preventing them from doing the very thing that we want them to do. How crazy is this? And so is it, is it maybe the old habits from before we became a Christian that we are still holding on to? Is it certain things that we do? Is it behaviors? Or, or maybe we're just a hypocrite. We're saying one thing and doing another. We're preaching a gospel yet living something that's contrary to that. You know, there, the, the reality is, is that many of us are hypocrites. The church is actually full of them. Let's just say it. And this is one of the reasons why many people won't step foot inside of a church. Like The church is full of hypocrites. The church is full of judgmental people. The church is full of people that, that don't care. So I begin to have this conviction in me when I hear things like this. You know, you're not the same person in the office that you are in public. You're not the same at home with your family as you are on a stage. See, as believers, we all have hang-ups and habits and things that we all are dealing with, maybe from our past. What people don't understand is that we're all on a journey together. This journey of faith. This journey of sanctification. And it's something that we're not going to get right this side of heaven. But thanks be to God who's rich in mercy. Who freely forgives us. But we don't take advantage of this free gift of forgiveness either. We pursue Jesus with everything that we have to become more like him every single day. And so when we become all things to all men so that we might reach some, this, this, it takes on this whole new meaning. That we would become like Jesus more so that we could reach people. Not that I would become like the sinner, but that I would become like Jesus because Jesus is the most attractive thing about me. And it should be for every single believer.
that Jesus is the most attractive thing about us. But sometimes we let religion get in the middle of Jesus. I'll say this, are you so religious that you can't have fun? I've been around those people. They're like a stick in the mud. They're like, oh, well, we can't do that. No. Or they speak in King James. Or they just talk regular until they pray, and then for some reason, all of a sudden, King James comes out, and you're like, where was that? Can you just talk to Jesus like everybody else? Instead of the these and thous and holy art thou, O Lord, thou bestowest. I'm like, what? Religion is something that turns unbelievers away. Or, or that churches themselves have their own secret language. We call it Christianese. We have catchphrases or we have terms that, that no one outside of the church knows, but everybody inside does. And so when a new person, an unbeliever, comes in that's never been in church and they hear those things, they're like, what? what did, I don't even know. What, is, what does that mean? I don't know. What? Do we have traditions within our church that are confusing? I mean, what is this thing about communion that you're eating his body and drinking his blood? I mean, that sounds kind of, that sounds a little creepy, actually, when you think about it. But there are things that we do that are 100% biblical, but if we don't explain some of these things, if we don't share what they are and, and help people understand, then they're always going to be uh, turned away. They're always going to be turned off. They're always going to reject those things because, like, man, being a Christian is just weird. And we've got to get past the weirdness as a church. We've got to get past the weirdness as a people of God, we've got to get past those things and become all things to all men so that we might reach some. And how do we do this? Well, we've got to break through the barriers and, and just be real people and be very honest and vulnerable about our own journey of faith and say, look, I don't, I'm not going to get it right. Yes, I've been a hypocrite. I am a hypocrite, but I'm chasing after Jesus Christ with everything that I've got, and I'm going to mess it up, and I'm going to do things that are contrary to the Word of God because I have, still have a sin nature within me, but I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit that is within me, that is cleansing me, that is doing a work inside of me, that is doing something that I can't do on my own, that only He can do, and that's what I'm trying to help you get to. That's the place I'm trying to help you understand. But a lot of times we don't get to that place because we have so many barriers. We speak the truth in an unloving way. We pass judgment on people without understanding their story. We misrepresent God when it comes to certain issues. We water down the gospel so we don't offend people. Let me tell you what it doesn't mean. Well, being, becoming all things to all men so that we might reach some does not mean that we will compromise on the gospel. It doesn't mean that we're going to shy away from our faith around certain people. You know, you know how it is. You're like, oh man, it's, my faith is, is great and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sing praises to the Lord when I'm around all my other friends that are also saying the same thing. But when we get to around our, peop, our friends or co-workers that aren't believers, well, all of a sudden we're like, Jesus who? Or you're not going to go as far to reach someone and, and, and get into addiction with them so that you might bring them out of addiction. You're not going to lose your salvation to be like them. Martin Luther said this, be careful not to measure your own holiness by other people's sin. But here's what it does mean. We're going to listen before we speak. 
We're going to think before we act. We're going to know before we assume. We're going to pray before we preach. We're never going to be ashamed of the gospel. We're going to find opportunities to win people for the Lord. And we're going to be led by the Holy Spirit to engage the people that we are trying to reach. This is the only way we're going to do it, is that we are led by the Spirit. And this is, this is the, the greatest story ever, is that we can be led by the Spirit to certain people, specific people. I mean, I have countless stories in my own life of where I have asked the Lord, Lord, lead me to the right person to talk to. And you know what? Every time he leads me to someone, he opens the conversation, and it's easy because it's being led by the Spirit. And we, when we are led by the Spirit, He shows us and He highlights people in order for us to go and talk to them and, and, and be able to share the good news with them. And this is what was happening with Paul and Timothy as we continue in verse 6. It says, And then, and they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, and having been for, forbidden by the Holy Spirit, they were, they were led by the Spirit, but they were also forbidden by the Holy Spirit. To speak the word in Asia. And when they came, uh, had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus didn't allow them. It's interesting that we are, when we are Spirit led, He opens doors and He closes others. And so passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, and, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there urging him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we, we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. I, I think this is very interesting. If you, if you look at on a map of where all these things are, God said, You can't go north, you can't go south. We came from the west, so it must be that we got to go east. It was very interesting to me. It's like all of these doors closed, and yet the one that was obvious is where they went. It's interesting. This is the humor that you read in Scripture. It was obvious that he concluded that this is where they had to go. Well, the Holy Spirit closed these other doors, so yes, it was obvious. So fun fact, who can tell me who wrote the book of Acts? Luke. All right. So in verse 10, we see there is a change from them and they. These aren't pronouns, you know, like we. To we. It says, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia. And so in verse 11, it says, so setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace. So now we have Paul, we have Timothy, we have Silas, and now we have Luke with them, even though he doesn't name themselves, but he is the writer of this, and he's always writing about them, and now he's saying we. These are the subtleties that you pick up on when you begin to read Scripture. The more you read it, the more things like this are like, Oh, that's interesting. Before it was them, now it's we. This is why it's important for all of you to be in the Word of God. And so then the following day, they went to Neapolis. And it's interesting how here in the United States, there's a small version of Neapolis. It's called Minneapolis. Um, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony, we remained in the city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went uh, outside the gate to the riverside where we, were where, we were where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and we spoke to the women who had come together. Here's a fun little interesting fact about this. So they went to a Gentile city. And, they, and, and Paul's MO, I said this a few weeks ago, is that he would always go to the synagogue first. He would always go to minister to the Jewish people first. And so he went to this place, and there was not a synagogue. So what did he do? He went outside of the walls of the, of the city to find people praying. 
And let me just tell you, historically, what, what happened is that there had to be at least 10 devout Jewish men in a city in order for an official synagogue to, uh, to start. So obviously, they did not have that yet, and so they were outside of the walls praying. There's a, another interesting thing, is that they were out by this river, they remained in the city, and on the Sabbath day, they went outside the gate to the riverside. And this is, this is just, this is, I mean, this is, again, this is how Scripture just comes alive. You see, the reason they went to pray by a river is because the river was moving, it was flowing, it was living water. You tracking with me? So what did Jesus say? He says, if you follow me, you're going to have rivers of what? Of living water within you. See, they, they wanted to go to the river of this li- where there was living waters in order for them to cleanse themselves, to ceremonially cleanse themselves. So they were there where, you know, a lot of times it was from a spring, so no human touch had, had, had uh, you know, no, nothing had touched the waters. It was pure. And this is what they used for purification. And now Jesus comes on the scene and says, hey, you don't need to go to a river anymore. I've got something better. I've got something that is a whole lot better for you that you're going to have within you rivers of living water. And it's going to be something that is so amazing that you're never going to thirst again. Man, it is just amazing. See, this is how Scripture comes alive. goes on to say in verse 14, it says, now... One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. And the Lord opened her heart. Let's just reside on that just for a second. Is that the Lord opened her heart. What would happen if the Lord opened your heart today? To what he wanted. What would it look like for you to freely just do that yourself? And to say, Lord, whatever you want, Spirit of God, I am an empty vessel. I want you, the river of living water, to reside in me. What would that look like? See, we saw over and over again how people would resist the Spirit. They would close off their heart to the work of the Lord. And yet, because of the work of the Lord through Paul, a woman named Lydia opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized, her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us, meaning she she said it in a convincing way. See, Paul, he became all things to all men, or in this case, he became all things to all women too for Lydia, so that someone like her would be saved. He met her where she was. He was, he was she, she was a woman, obviously, of, of means. So, she, so Paul talked to her in a way that she could relate to. You know, it's, it's interesting how we, we sometimes we talk to people in ways that, we, that, that they just cannot relate. The church is notorious for that. Talking to people in ways that you just don't understand. Instead of just saying things plainly in common English. See, Paul met Lydia at a place and spoke to her and met with her and built a rapport with her. And I believe that through that, the Lord began to open her heart and she was open to what Paul had to say. Man, that is the greatest model 
we could ever have. So the result was not only that she was saved, but her entire family was saved too. And this is the power of the gospel, is that when we can build a rapport and build a relationship with someone, that we can become all things to all men, or we can become all things to that singular person, then they are open to the gospel, they are open to the good news of Jesus Christ, and maybe they become followers of Jesus Christ, and then what happens is that then they begin to share that same good news with the people that are around them. Maybe their whole family then becomes saved. Let me, let me just tell you that statistically speaking, that if you can reach the man of the house, you can reach the whole family. If you can reach the, the, the woman of the house, the mom, then usually there's about a 60% chance of them all coming to church. If you reach the kids, the, the statistics drop as you go down the line. But if you can reach dad... The whole family follows. And this is why we're doing things like a men's breakfast. That we can reach men so that their whole household would come to know Jesus Christ. You see, some people need a picture book version of the gospel. And we've got to be able to share it in a way that they'll understand. Some people need a textbook version. They need all the details and the big words and all those things in order for them to grasp what the gospel is. Some people need a visual uh, representation of the gospel through your own life. They need to see the gospel played out in you. It's not about reading this. It's not about showing them here. It's showing them your life. Sometimes the greatest testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ is through your own actions and words. And still others, they're going to need a regular conversation for many years before they open their heart. So the Lord opened Lydia's heart, and she believed. And we're going to see later in the chapter, she opened her home, and it became a church. See, becoming all things to all men can result in not only one person being saved, but a whole family being saved. Maybe the establishment of a small group. We've got small group fair coming up next week. Man, you, we want all of you to be involved in a small group. This is where we get, we build relationship. This is where we learn together. This, it's a whole lot better than just being disconnected in a big room. Uh, Bible study. This is where fellowship starts. Becoming all things to all men results in prayer gatherings, in worship moments, and even the church. And let me just tell you that there's no special formula for reaching people. But the Holy Spirit guiding us and leading us to the right people, that is how the gospel is furthered. This is our mission. This is the, the great commission that Jesus Christ even says, go into all the world. I'm going to ask the band to come up. Go into all the world and teach people. Become all things to all men so that you might reach them, so that they can become disciples, so that they can become followers of Jesus Christ, so that their home will be saved, so that their family will be saved, so their relatives will be saved, their co-workers will be saved. This is the, this is the mission of God that he has for his people, and you are his people.